Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Bible study. Uh, my name is Dave Everett. This is my wife, Sherry. And uh, we're doing our Bible study on Don't Limit God by Andrew Womack. And we're really just uh, halfway through. I think this is like our 11th uh, lesson on this. But uh, uh, we're about halfway through. We're starting a new chapter tonight uh, t t t titled The Fear of Man. Uh, again, this is a, a book by Andrew Womack, uh, Don't Limit God. And uh, anyway, uh, feel free to introduce yourself, say hello, where you're from, uh, uh, website below, uh, we'll, put it, we'll put in the comments below, uh, lighthousediscipleship.org, where you can go to our message pages, and you can go and find our previous lessons on, on this Bible study. Excuse me. Uh, but anyway, thank you for joining us, uh, we're going to... Uh, jump right on in, in here. Uh, feel free to put any comments down below. Hopefully pertaining to the Bible study and as well as any prayer requests you may need. Uh, if you need a private message, so you can do that as well. Uh, anyway, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Sherry, once we get uh, dialed in here, we're going to narrate uh, as we start our new chapter, The Fear of Men, on, on our Bible study here. So anyway, uh, go ahead. Okay. When God spoke to me in 2002, and told me I was limiting him, I realized I was doing so because of fear. There are many types of fear that can hinder us and limit God. Fear activates Satan and releases his power the same way that faith activates God and releases his power. Fear paralyzes people. It is not a good thing. Yet many people are living their lives in fear. One fear that limits what God can do in our lives is the fear of man also known as persecution. One of the reasons I was limiting God in my life was because I had a fear of man. I was afraid of persecution. If a certain dog bit you every time you bent over to pet it, after a while you would probably quit petting that dog. Nobody likes to be bitten. Nobody likes to be persecuted. If you enjoy people hating you, being mad at you, and saying bad things about you, then something is wrong with you. God created us for relationship and fellowship. Enjoying hatred, strife, and persecution is not normal. If someone goes through life glorifying and rubbing people the wrong way, something is wrong with that person. It is not normal or natural for us to like people hating and criticizing us. I don't like people being mad at me, but I've come to the place where I can overcome it and it won't keep me from doing what God's called me to do. I just cast my cares about it on the Lord. 1 Peter 5 7. When the Lord spoke to me about limiting him, we were covering about 5% of the U.S. market with our television program. We were reaching people and good things were happening, but we were flying below the radar. No one really zeroed in on me because I wasn't that big of a deal. I was enjoying my an 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 anonymity and enjoying not being criticized. I knew that if I fulfilled what God told me to do and became a major player in the body of Christ, someone who was really influencing others, there was going to be persecution. I wasn't looking forward to do this. So I was dog paddling instead of swimming. I was just content just floating along instead of pursuing what God called me to do. When you start doing what God called you to do, you have a huge target drawn on your back. Increased influence comes with increased criticism. When someone gets promoted into a leadership position, they will be picked apart with a fine-tooth comb. People will put a magnifying glass on that person and analyze and criticize everything they do. That's why most people would rather stay in the background. They don't want to face the criticism and persecution that go along with stepping out and doing what God has called them to do. But this fear of persecution will limit what God can do in their lives. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have a lot of comments here right at the very beginning. Uh, again, this is Dave and Sherry Everett. We're doing a Bible study on Don't Limit God by Andrew Womack. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free to say hello uh, whatnot. But uh, anyway, uh, we're in a new chapter today uh, calling The Fear of Man. We're going to actually get to the, the verse uh, that's in our next section uh, from Proverbs. You know, the fear of man is a snare. Uh, anyway, Andrew's just being very, very blunt, honest, you know. Uh, 
uh, no one likes persecution. No one likes to be hated. No one likes to be made fun of. Uh, no one likes to, people to be mad at them. Uh, at the same point, by the same point in time, uh, we, uh, persecution can limit us, uh, especially when we have the fear of man, when we have the fear of rejection, when we have the fear of what people are going to do to us. No one likes that, but that can also limit us. And it can be a, a fear, as he's saying, can be a paralytic. And, uh, and Sherry and I can attest to that, uh, I mean, big time. I mean, I just, I'll just speak for myself. You know, we've gone through some things in the, the past few years, uh, so I don't know if I want to call it persecution. I don't know what, what, what to call it, but uh, uh, definitely some hatred. We've, had, we've encountered some opposition, that's for sure. And uh, so, uh, and a lot of that has to do with relationships and and people are trying to uh, destroy us in our ministry and whatnot. So I guess you could say, in a sense, that's a form of persecution. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, I'm not trying so much to talk about us. But we, you know, none of that's fun. Uh, none of that is enjoyable. And but at the, at the end of the day, I think this is where Andrew's going. We got to do what God's called us to do. And uh, you know, I just think of all kinds of people in the Bible who did what God called them to do despite uh, rejection. Uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph, uh, even David, you know, ran for his life. Uh, I can think of Esther and Mordecai uh, um, and, and, and uh, others throughout the scripture. They weren't always so popular. And doing what God's called you to do is not always going to be popular. And we're not doing this for popularity. We're doing this because this is what God calls us to do. And, uh, um, you, know, you know, it's funny because I uh, uh, all my life I wanted to be in ministry. All my life I wanted to pastor and preach the gospel. And I thought a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, when we started going back, going to ministry, I thought people would just be excited. Way to go, Dave, you know, type of thing. And it was, it's been quite the opposite. We've had our, our share of encouragement, don't get me wrong, but we've also had uh, a share of uh, discouragement, too. And, uh, and so um, we just haven't had the... We've, we've, we've encountered a lot of opposition. I mean, we just want to preach the gospel, seeing lives genuinely change and transform by the power of the gospel, by the power of having a relationship with God. And that's our heartbeat, uh, our biggest, our gifting, our uh, whatever we focus on, discipleship. I don't want to just give people a fish dinner. I want to teach them how to fish. I want to teach them. I want them to be equipped. I want them to be grounded in who they are in Christ. I'm not saying they're necessarily going to be masters at this, uh, with uh, some PhD or whatever, but I want them to be equipped. And, you know, really, discipleship is a long, it's in front of the long haul. Uh, I'm still being discipled. You know, we still need to be discipled. We still need to uh, grow. If, when the moment we stop growing, we're dying. And uh, we got to keep growing. we got to keep going forward. we got to keep maturing. Um, you know, sometimes we get our feet dirty, our hands dirty in the process. Sometimes we just need to be you know, we just need to, uh, I forget what that term is, uh, deprive or uh, a reprieve? A reprieve. You know, uh, sometimes we're in the midst of the battle, we just need a, you know, sabbatical. I know that is a, a time to recharge. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and that is right. You know, God created us for relationship. God created us for, for fellowship. And when that is threatened, when that is challenged, when that is absent, you know, uh, that's not fun. Because God did not create us for that. You know, God created the body of Christ to be fitly knitted together uh, as a family. Uh, and I know there's gonna, that's going to take different shapes and sizes. And, you know, there's different uh, levels of relationships, you know. Uh, Jesus had the multitudes, he had the 70, he had the 12, and then he had the 3. And so there's going to be different levels of relationships, even in the body of Christ. There's some organs in our body that are essential. And there's some that are important, but not they're not necessarily as essential. For example, you know, my eyes, I consider them important. But I can still live without my eyes. I can still live without my ears. But I can't live without my brain. I can't live without my heart. And there's some other organs I can't live without. It. Now, I'm not going to have a quality of life without my eyes and ears and some other parts of the body. Uh, uh, but I, I, they're, they're not as critical. Um, and so... Uh, I, I guess I'm just painting a picture. There's going to be some relationships that are going to be more intimate, they're more, more critical, uh, more essential than others. Uh, but we need the whole body of Christ. And, uh, anyway, that's kind of getting into another category. Uh, we're not going to tonight. So we're talking about the fear of man. 
We're talking about Don't Limit God, and uh, we're going to go ahead and read another section here, unless you have something to share before that, Sherry. No, I'm good. Okay, so this section is called Fear of Man Brings a Snare. I always tell our Bible college students that if they came to Bible college looking for something wrong, we have something for them. We are people. We aren't perfect. If someone comes and picks us apart, they will find something to criticize. The easiest way for most people to look good is by tearing others down and criticizing them. That's just human nature. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, 25. The vast majority of Christians are insecure because they are so paranoid about somebody criticizing them. For instance, many ministers won't speak the truth about what the Word of God says because it's not politically correct. If we are so insecure that we can't handle another person criticizing us, we will never see God's fullness in our lives. We will limit God's plan for us. But this insecurity is real even for those who are not preachers. There are other subtle ways in which they can limit God. For instance, if our co-workers are talking about something that completely violates everything we believe in, most of us probably would not stand up for the truth because we are afraid of criticism and persecution. Although they wouldn't physically beat us up, they would look at us and roll their eyes. They wouldn't include us in their inner circle. They may even begin to avoid us. Yet most Christians will not speak the truth because it's politically incorrect. This is the fear of man, and it will limit God. Okay. All right. Thank you. I thought that section was a little longer than that. But uh, anyway, yeah, this is the key verse that we're going to get to tonight. Uh, Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but, but whose putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. You know, uh, I just did a teaching series on the fear of God. You know, fear is can also be translated as who we are trusting in, who are we relying on, who are we honoring, who are we respecting. And when it comes down to it, we need to respect God and not man. Uh, I'm, not here, I'm not saying we're going to disrespect people. But we need to put our trust in God. We need to trust Him. We need to have a reverence for Him, not man, in that regard. Um, you know, we want to be a blessing to others. But that also means we're going to speak the truth. You know, uh, I, I just appreciate those I have in my life that just can be candid. They can be truthful. Yes, I think we can be candid in the right way. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, sh share it with grace, but we need to just be forward. Uh, you know, I had a good friend, uh, Javier Diaz, and one thing I liked about him was that we just could be candid with each other. Uh, we'd be, we, you know, we, we trusted one another, we honored one another, but we were also frank with one another. And I, I just like that, you know, and uh, we need those people in our lives that can... Yeah, I can speak into our lives, and so anyway, uh, the fear of man. The fear of man brings a snare, and it, uh, what's a snare? A snare is a trap. Um, you know, it's a trap, and so when you know, no one likes to be criticized. No one likes the rejection. No one likes um, uh, hatred and persecution, and specifically the kind of what we're talking about. But at the same point in time, you know, we can't let the fear of man, what man may do to us, to stop us doing, teaching and saying what God, what's, what's true. Uh, you know, I'm not interested so much in being politically correct. I'm not necessarily uh, on a mission to be politically incorrect. But I'm not on a mission to be politically correct either. I'm on a mission to be biblically correct. I'm on a mission to be God correct, uh, Christ correct. Uh, I'm not just trying to be uh, politically incorrect for political incorrectness. I, I'm not doing that. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think, you know, we can obey the laws of the land and even society to a point. Uh, but once they contradict biblical values, uh, that's where we can't, we don't cross the line. Uh, that makes sense. You know, when we got on mission trips before, we learned, not, we learned a little bit about the culture. We learned about some things or some maybe some gestures that may be offensive to them. Uh, to them, it would be politically incorrect to do certain things. I'm trying to think of an example, but there's some, th some things that we learn in different cultures you just don't do. You just don't say. You just don't. Uh, and so it would be, in that sense, politically incorrect in that society, if that makes sense. So we don't want to do some things that would 
that would purposefully offend them. At the same point in time, uh, we're not going to back down from the truth. We're not going to back down from the gospel. We're not going to back down from godliness. You know, there's a verse in, uh, I think it's in Ephesians or Colossians, those who desire to be godly will be, those who desire to be godly in Christ Jesus, specifically, will, will be persecuted. If you desire to be godly, you will be persecuted. Andrew has a saying to that, well, if you, uh, if you, if you don't desire to be godly, then you're not going to be persecuted. You know, or if you're not being persecuted, then maybe you don't desire to be godly. Uh, because it says, to, Paul is saying, Paul is speaking, those who desire to be godly will be persecuted. So if you're not being persecuted, then perhaps you're not living or desiring to be godly. You know, and that can be, that can, in one sense, that can be a, kind of a gauge on the dashboard. Uh, you know, if, uh, a lot of times if we're not getting any type of persecution, then we're, perhaps we're going in the same direction as the enemy. You know, we should be bumping into the enemy. Uh, I mean, I keep using these examples, but Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph, were going against the grind at times, uh, especially Daniel uh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were bumping into some things. You know, David was bumping into some things. Paul, the apostles, bumped into some things along the way. Uh, they didn't. They weren't necessarily everyone's favorite. Uh, you know, and we can't. We're not. We can't be striving for that. Uh, at the same point in time. No one wants to be rejected. No one wants to go through any type or shape or form of persecution or ridicule or, or, or backbiting or gossip or slander. Uh, there's so many different ways of, to paint the picture. But at the same point in time, we can't live our lives paralyzed by the fear of man. It will rob you from being who God's called you to be. It will rob you from doing what God's called you to do. That cannot be the measure on your dashboard whether you're offending people or not. You know, the gospel itself will be offensive to people. We're not trying to offend people to offend people. That can't be the case. And we, we shouldn't, that should never be our, our, our aim, our target. Uh, but at the same point in time, you know, we're here to help people. But some people just don't want to be helped. And, uh, and they're going to persecute us and whatnot. And so uh, they're not mad at us. They're mad at the gospel. Uh, but we need to learn to be frank with people. We, we need to learn to teach the truth to people in love. With all respect, with all honor, with all gentleness, uh, we we need to do that. But we need to, uh, you know, we need to learn the spirit of gentleness. Uh, some people don't need to work on that. Um, some people need to learn how to be bold and, and, and speak the truth, speak it in love. You want to have anything you want to add? I don't have, uh, I guess, a, a too big a thought to share. But please understand this: we're not being insensitive. We've, we've been hurt by what we're talking about. Dave alluded to it. So we understand how hurtful it is to be rejected, to have others get on you and come after you uh, when you're trying to live godly and, and be a witness and a blessing and speak the truth in love. E even, even sometimes when you're not doing anything and you have someone come against you. It's not fun. It's not fun to be corrected, whether it be the right way or the wrong way uh, at all. Um, so please hear our hearts. If, if you are going through something like this, we're not, we're not putting, brushing that under the carpet. We are hurting for you. And there's a word here just before we go to the next section, you know, uh, Andrew uses the word insecure. I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fear of man. Uh, you know, and everything Sherry just said, you know, our hearts hurt for those who have been wounded by persecution or, or uh, just ugliness uh, from different people. But at the same point in time, we don't want to be, when we're talking about the fear of man and it brings a snare, we don't want to be so insecure uh, that we are just hiding in our hole and not willing to speak the truth and not willing to preach the gospel. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to preach the gospel in season and out of season. You know, sometimes people will just hear what they want to hear. Um, but we need, we need to be, in other words, we need to be so secure in Christ. We need to be so secure in who we are in Christ and who we are in God that, you know, in one sense of the word, we don't care what people think. Uh, you know, we do, but we don't. Uh, we want we want them to think the truth. We want them to to, to uh, receive us enough so they can receive what we have to say. 
but we also know that's not going to always be the case. Uh, we can't be insecure. We need to be secure. See, insecurity is pride. Insecurity is, uh, when I talk about pride and humility, I always use the scene of David and Goliath. David was the most humble person on that scene. Now, look, from one point of view, it might seem like he, he was haughty. That's what his brother thought he was. Uh, his brother Eliab thought he was haughty. But David was trusting God. He knew that God, he knew his covenant relationship with God and his trust was in God. And this Goliath, this uncircumcised Philistine, was nothing. God could protect him from the lion, the bear, and, and this Goliath. Whereas King Saul and all the armies of Israel were wallowing in fear, insecure for 40 days. That's pride. They were focused on themselves, what they could not do. David was focused on what his God could do. And that's where our security needs to be. Our security is not in us. Our security is in him. And, you know, God will give vengeance. And, you know, uh, God will protect us. God will be our defense. God, you know, we talk about so many times in these Bible studies how salvation, soteria, means healing, wholeness. But salvation also means deliverance. Our God is a delivering God. God can deliver us uh, from the enemy. Uh, you know, and so we need to be sober-minded because our enemy is like a lion seeking who may devour. Being sober-minded. We can't be so worried. We can't be so insecure. We need to be sober-minded. I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about being sober-minded. When you're worried, when you're insecure... When you're fretting over man, when you're when you're so insecure, you can't even uh, function. You know, uh, you know. Even with this COVID, we need to be wise in certain areas. We need to be respectful in certain ways, but we can't be so paranoid that we're no, no, we're not, we can't function. That's not God. That's not God. And so, uh, I'm not saying we don't be wise. I'm not saying we don't be respectful. Uh, you know, to the weak, be weak, come the weak to win the weak. But at the same point in time. I'm not going to live with paranoia uh, over some disease that Christ has already purchased on the cross. Christ has already redeemed me from every disease. I'm not going to live a life of paranoia over some some uh, COVID, over any flu. You know, I don't believe in sickness. I haven't been sick since 2009. I'm not starting now. And so, uh, anyway, Sherry, you got something? I do. Just to piggyback on dad, uh, on dad, on Dave. Uh, reminding us to we just need to be established in who we are in Christ and I know Dave likes to quote 2 Corinthians um, uh, 5 21 about uh, we are the righteousness in, let me start from the beginning he who knew no sin be, became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus we need to realize that we are righteous because of Christ, we are beloved because of Christ, but we also need to realize in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. It's God who establishes us. It's God who's, who's anointing us in Christ Jesus. And when we really get that and hold on to that, when we just are so secure in who we are, nothing can knock us off that strong foundation. That's when we triumph in Christ. You know, people who have testimonies of healing or... Um, whatever the testimony might might be, it's because they hung on to who they are in Christ and what Christ has done for us, and they didn't build the, the foundation. They didn't have a weak foundation and tried to, to build on it. They built on the foundation that Christ already established, a foundation that can't be moved. And that's why they're so strong in who they are, that that's... That's why they they got the victory is is because of that uh, establishment, so to speak, of of what God did in us in Christ Jesus, and they grabbed hold of that, and they will 
they did not let go. You know, that's why the apostles held on and preached the gospel after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, they could have given up. Oh, you know, our Savior died. But no, Jesus rose again, and he came and walked with them, broke bread with them. When they realized how true the gospel was, they, they, didn't, they didn't sway from who they were in Christ. They didn't, they didn't sway because of persecution. It wasn't easy. I think all but John got, got martyred. But if, if the gospel wasn't true, why, why would have they held on to that foundation? You know, they realized who they were in Christ, and they, they kept going with, with what God has called them to do. And I encourage you, you know, no matter what God has called you to do, for one thing, it's important. Because God wouldn't have called you to do it if it wasn't. And you might think it's little or whatever compared to someone else's calling, but that's not the truth. And we, I know we keep talking about this. I keep talking about this every time we get on Bible study, but I just want to encourage you. It's God who establishes us and sets us on the course that we are to go. And I encourage you to, to hold on with, with all your worth because I want you to see breakthrough. I want you to see blind eyes healed and deaf ears healed and people, set, people who are captive, captive set free. You know, God, God's, God wants you set free. All right. All right, let's go ahead and read a little bit more, Sherry. Uh, stand up for the truth. <coughs> and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. 1 Kings 17, <coughs> verse 1. Elijah stood up in front of a king who was killing all of God's prophets. He walked right up to him and said, Thus saith the Lord. Elijah identified himself with God, knowing that being one of God's ministers, he could be killed. Yet Elijah boldly walked up in front of all the people and said, Thus saith the Lord, it will not rain until I say so. Since Elijah was bold enough to speak the truth, within three years he was the central figure of that entire nation. The king was taking orders from Elijah because he stood up and spoke the truth. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou, thou shalt in <coughs> any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Le Leviticus 19.17 most people won't stand up and speak for morality when people talk about shacking up with each other and acting like dogs and alley cats. We should stand up and say, did you know that's destructive? You need to make it a, com a commitment. Why would you want to live with someone who's not even committed to you? One of the main reasons people shack up instead of making a commitment through, through marriage is that the first time something goes wrong, they can leave without any encumbrances. We will limit what God can do through us if we know something is true, but won't stand up for the truth because we are afraid of what people will say. There is zero excuse for this in America. In foreign countries, many have given their lives standing up for the truth. That's true persecution. But in our country, we feel persecuted if people just look at us in a certain way. We have become addicted to everyone's acceptance. We receive our ego boost and acceptance from others, so we become codependent on people. We need our spouses, coworkers, children, in-laws, or outlaws approval. I'm not saying we should enjoy the rejection of others, but we should get to a place where if God loves us, which he does, then that ought to be sufficient for us. When we have a fear of man and let criticism and rejection keep us from doing what God called us to do, we limit him. Amen. Amen. I, I like this. Uh, um, anyway, a few things I just feel like I comment on. Uh, you know, I want to be bold like Elijah uh, and just be able to speak the truth, you know, uh, and whatnot. But also, you know, uh, Andrew speaking, also, he wrote this before, you know, the day and age that we're, we're living in now where 
Speaking the truth is, uh, and persecution in our country is actually increasing. Uh, to speak the truth is very, it's becoming very, very more, um, uh, it's, not, it's not just people criticizing us, it's not just us, people getting up and leaving the, your church or whatnot, even though some of that still happens today um, in our culture. But uh, persecution is on the rise. And, uh, but we need to be so secure in God that we need to be so secure in His love for us that any type of criticism or rejection is not going to cause us to limit God from working in our lives. You know, even in the day and age that we're living in, with all that's going on with COVID and everything, this is a time for the church to shine. This is a time for the church to rise up. You know, this is just a perfect time. I believe a, a big revival's coming, you know, and uh, uh, it's time for the church to, to be the church. It's not, we're not limited to a building. We're not limited to things. You know, it's time for uh, the church to be the church and, uh, and minister to people in very innovative ways, but bringing the truth to them, bringing the gospel to them, uh, ministering love, speaking the truth where it needs to be spoken. You know, and I even spoke on this a little bit this morning, but letting our lives just be a testimony and letting God do such a work in our lives, in our own lives, our own finances, our own health, our own relationships, our own uh, everything, that people just look at our lives and go, wow, that's what God did. You know, not that everything's going to be a bed of roses, but they can see our lives and can say, you know what, well, I want what you got. And so, um, anyway, uh, our lives should be that, that much of a testimony. Despite the persecution, despite rejection, despite what some people may do to us, they can still look at us and say, you know what, uh, wow, you know, they, even when people have attacked us, we're just like that little weevil, and you just knock it down, it just comes right back up. We knock it down, it comes back up, and, and so uh, just, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever had one of those little weevils where every time you push it down, it just it bounces back up. Well, I, I think, you know, when people watch us, they can just see that, you know what, uh, uh, they just can't destroy us because like Daniel, like Joseph, like others, you know, we're just going to stand up for the truth. And, uh, and I think that speaks volumes to people. And it's going to, you know, Daniel, Joseph, they reach kings, they reach pharaohs, they reach uh, world leaders. Uh, I believe we can reach world leaders because of just how integrity and uh, how we stand for the truth, even in this day, even in this hour that we live in. So, anything else? Okay, let's keep reading. God is enough. Yes, he is. I have a Scandinavian friend who was ministering in Africa and had started some churches there. He was really struggling because it seemed like nothing was working for him. One day he was out in the jungle complaining about how nobody loved him and how people hadn't accepted him. All of a sudden the Lord spoke to him in such a loud voice that the ground shook. He could actually see the trees swaying as God asked, Walter, aren't I enough? Needless to say, Walter repented. When he realized he had been limiting God because of the fear of man, he stopped complaining and instead planted over 500 churches in Africa. We all need to stop limiting God in our lives and get to a place where God is enough. It's amazing how insecure we become when we aren't in a vibrant relationship with God. We need to have everyone else's approval. The only people who will ever let us down are those whom we lean on. If we don't lean on anybody but Jesus, nobody can let us down. If the Lord tells us to move to Africa or someplace else and we stop to consider what our family or others would think, we have the fear of man. I'm not saying we shouldn't be thinking about these things or that we should present what has God said in a way that's offensive. But for us to debate whether we're going to do what God tells us to do because someone might not like it is a fear of man. As a minister, I've had to deal with this a lot. I don't like it when people hate me or spit in my face. Nobody does. One thing that really helped me was when the Lord instructed me to sell someone something that I knew this person didn't want to hear. I knew they weren't going to like it. So I was debating whether or not to say anything. Finally, the Lord spoke to me and said that I had no right to reject the truth for this person. He told me that we need to give people the right to reject his word on their own. This changed my thinking as I realized that when we don't tell people the truth 
because we're afraid of how they might respond, we reject the truth for them. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, God's enough. You know, we can't reject the we can't reject the truth for people. We can't reject the gospel for people. Uh, we can't reject healing for people. Whatever the case may be, we can't reject it because we're just too paralyzed in fear that they're going to be rejected. You know, when we stop complaining and stop wallowing in fear and just start doing what God calls us to do, whatever that may be, uh, you know, uh, we can do exploits in His name. You know, maybe you know. Uh, I, I don't know what God's called you to do. You know, we talked about this in previous lessons. You know, just out of a relationship with God, God will show you what to do. And maybe part of what God wants you to do is to, to support a pastor, support someone else so they can do what God calls them to do. I, I think I mentioned this uh, a week or two ago, but, you know, when when uh, Mo, Israel went to battle just after they uh, uh, came out of Egypt, Joshua was leading the, the battle. This is when the, the sun stood still. But Moses was also on the mountain uh, raising up his hands, and as his hands were lifted up, Israel was winning the battle. When his hands came down, they were losing the battle. But Aaron and Hur were right by Moses' side. And every time Moses got tired from holding up his hands, Aaron and Hur would help him and hold his hands up for him. You know, uh, Moses, I mean Joshua could not have fought that battle that he was ordained to fight if it wasn't for Moses. But he also couldn't have fought, fought that battle if it wasn't for Aaron and Hur. Aaron and Hur were really the heroes. I mean, Aaron, Joshua fought the battle and all the soldiers. But uh, maybe Moses left his hand, was obedient and lifted his hands up. But Aaron and Hur, to me in my picture, they were the, they were the true heroes. Because without them, uh, Moses couldn't have his hands up and, and Joshua couldn't have fought the battle. So maybe what God's calling you to do is just be an Aaron and her. Uh, to, to lift someone else's hands up so they can do what God's called to do. Because if someone's in ministry, a pastor, a prophet, someone like Andrew, whatever, they're going through some battles. And they can use some hers. I know we could have used some. And I'm not, I'm not trying to advertise that right now. That's not what I'm after. But at the same point in time, you know, we uh, do what God's called you to do. And so... Uh, even at a time like this, there's, you know, there's a time where we can get on the phone, we can help people. Some people are struggling because of finances and jobs, because of COVID and different things. Uh, but this is a time when we can shine, we can do some marvelous things. And so, and so anyway, uh, I just think, you know, don't let fear, don't let the fear of rejection, don't let the fear of criticism, don't let the fear of man keep you or limit you or limit what God wants to do in your life and through your life. And I, I say this knowing that I've, I've, I've had plenty of times where I've let criticism, rejection, some severe hatred that I've even enjoyed with some people uh, to get us down and whatnot. And we got to do what God's called us to do. And uh, uh, in some ways it should encourage us uh, that we're going to do the right thing. Uh, but I know sometimes it's hard. Uh, sometimes we go through some very severe stuff. And I know some of the things that Sherry and I have gone through have been very severe. Um, if you just even knew what we've gone through. But uh, I'm not here to magnify what's happened to us. I'm here to magnify the gospel. I'm here to magnify what God can do. I'm here to magnify that we, and even in all that we've gone through, we can't limit God. And we can't let the fear of man win the battle. Uh, I can't be a snare. Where, see, a snare is not just a trap. But if you're in a trap, you're stuck. You're stuck. And there's so many times Sherry and I have felt stuck. And I think a lot of that is because we've had a fear of man. And we just got stuck in the snare. And we just uh, need someone to help us get out. And uh, yeah, if, that makes, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I think of, anytime I think of a snare, I think of a bear trap. Yeah, it's going to be painful uh, to that leg that's got trapped. trap. But they're stuck. You know, and I, or, whatever, or maybe it's a little pit. Uh, I think of I'm in the jungle with this big net catching you and you're just hanging from the tree in this net because you've fallen into the trap. You know, and sometimes we just feel like we've been in a snare and well, uh, that's the fear of man. And we just need to let God be our refuge and let God be our strength. And let God be the, you know, I have another good friend who said one time, you know, 
You're Dave, at the end of the day, you're dancing before the audience is born. You're dancing before the audience is born. And uh, so anyway, I'll be blessed with that. So can you anything you have? No. Um, just I encourage you to read the, the, God, the, the Bible and just be encouraged by the different heroes of faith. You know, Gideon comes to mind and how he was living in the fear of man. They had this other nation coming against them and uh, even coming in and, and, and still in their crops that they were raising for food. And he was actually hiding to thresh some, some grain. And when God called him, he made all sorts of excuses about he was the weakest uh, or puniest of his family. And, and yet he listened to God and he held on. And, and even though he had some, some big fear to, to overcome, he, he was a, he was a, a victor. Um, he, 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 he listened to what, what God said and, and said, okay, God, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. I, I don't get it. I don't know why you're calling me because I feel weak and, and stupid and puny and, and there's so other people bigger and smarter than me, but because you said it, I'm going to do it. And and Israel won. You know, I, I like Peter's words when, when they were fishing all night, when Jesus said to cast the net on the other side. He, I mean, he, he had an excuse. He said, we've, we've caught nothing. We fished all night and caught nothing. But nevertheless, Lord, at your word, we will do it. And Peter stepped out in faith and got the biggest catch ever. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Lord, I get it. And I'm speaking to myself too. Lord, I, I, I get I have this fear coming against me. But you gave me this word. Your word is true. In fact, you magnify your word above your name. You are faithful. So nevertheless, Lord, at your word. I will do it. There's, there's a reason why God says so many times to do not fear. I am with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and do some more. We're making a lot of progress as far as the book is concerned, so let's go keep reading. Many people are afraid someone is going to criticize them or reject them, reject them. So they are paralyzed and unable to do what God tells them to do. Once, in one of my meetings, hundreds of people raised their hands when asked if they would go to Bible college if they had no restraints. Some common restraints people have are the thoughts. What would my family think? What would a particular person think? People are think going to think I've lost my mind. All of this is a fear of man, which will limit God. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, 25. Some people who have come to our Bible college, however, are not allowed such restraints to stop them. Have not allowed such restraints to stop them. There was one woman from Utah whose husband told her that he would divorce her if she got on the plane to come to our Bible college. Their marriage was already in trouble, so she came anyway, and he divorced her. Because of situations like this, people become paralyzed and don't obey what God tells them to do. We need to come to a place where, when God speaks to us, nobody else is going to stop us from doing what he told us to do. Fear of man will bring bondage into our lives, so we need to get over it. We cannot respect or honor anyone else's opinion as much as we honor God's opinion. Yeah, I think again a lot of this is just an echo, uh, but it's the same refrain over and over again. But sometimes we just need to hear it over and over again. You know, we just can't, we can't let the fear of God. I know, I'm sorry. We can't let the fear of man limit us or limit God's influence and work in our lives. Uh, you know, I mean, I just think of this one lady who, uh, whose husband told her that uh, she, he would divorce her if she went to Bible college. You know. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying every situation is the same, but, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, this marriage was already in trouble for that to even come up to, to be a question. 
uh, that marriage was already in, in shambles. But at the same point in time, uh, you know, some people have gone through very severe things to do what God's called them to do. And, uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, obviously, you need to make sure you hear from God to do something like that. Uh, you know, I'm not saying everyone needs to just walk, walk out of their spouse and go to Bible college. That's not the, that's not the message here. Uh, but at the same point in time, there's times where we just know, we know that we know what God's called us to do. <coughs> and uh, we can't have the fear of man from, calling, from doing that, you know. And so uh, we just, we can't walk from man's approval. We have to live off God's direction and his, his influence in our lives. So anyway, um, everything. Just as a side note, you know, we have we have ministered to couples in the past where one of them says, well, God's told me to do this. This is the ministry he's put on my heart. This is what he's called me to do. And the other spouse says the same thing, but it's something entirely different. And so they come to the conclusion, well, God must have made a mistake and not brought us together, or we've made a mistake. And I want to say, no, that's not true. Because, yes, there are times when in a marriage, couples come together and they have the same ministry path, like Dave and I, where it just fits so completely together. But if, if a spouse has this vision and the other spouse has this vision, I want to encourage you to pray and seek the Lord together because... It could be that there's a puzzle piece that fits together and the two visions become one. And it is, I want, I want to make sure that I, I make myself clear. I just want, want you guys to listen to what Andrew and what Dave and I are sharing. We're just because one person is strong in this way and the other person this way. You know, don't let fear of man, don't let division and disagreement or let the enemy come in and do like what Dave encouraged you to do. Make sure, make sure, make sure you're hearing from God. Yeah, you know, anytime, you know, I'll just speak for us, because we're, we're married and maybe you're not married, but maybe you are. And so when we have major decisions, a major move, um, you know, uh, major job change or whatever the case may be, uh, major finances, whatever, we always come in agreement. We just don't, we just don't make decisions like that without us being in agreement. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, God doesn't want discord uh, and whatnot, yeah. so uh, that's not the case. And we also realize that if a major decision, if something goes south, further down the pipeline, we don't want it to be a major foothold for the enemy to use against one another. Well, I didn't even want to come here, but I came here because you pushed me to come, and so now that this becomes a big major strife in the marriage. That's, we're not going to do that. So, uh, you know, there's been times when we've made moves and different things, but uh, uh, we were in agreement uh, on that. And now, again, uh, you know, our vision kind of kind of fits together like a glove, but I understand where some people, marriage visions uh, seem like to be, be complete opposites. I still think there's a way that those can complement each other, and even if it's a, to, even if it's to the point where this person's doing this ministry, this person's doing this ministry, but you're encouraging one another, that can very well be the case too. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And that's not how we operate, because that's not how our giftings and our marriages put together. But our marriage is not the same as yours, and so it's not for me to, to judge or criticize yours. Uh, it's, but, but to work in harmony, to be together at it, to be in a marriage, uh, oneness with each other is. Uh, and there's some principles there. And, uh, and we can still complement and support each other. Uh, sometimes people's vocation, maybe it's not, we're not talking about ministry, but we're just talking about vocations. Like, how can this vocation work with this vocation? Well, if that's where God comes in. And we get direction. You know, see, everything stems back to a relationship with God. And if something doesn't make sense to us, well, that's where you go back to God and, and get some answers. But, if, you know, uh, if you haven't learned to understand His voice, if you haven't learned to understand Him talking to you, it's going to be harder uh, to uh, just on the fly uh, once in a while. 
But we need to have, the, the, the most important thing you can ever do is develop a relationship with God. So that when you need answers, you need direction, you need clarification, uh, you need wisdom, you can go get that from God. And I have a not and, and, and listen to that. And so, uh, he, He'll direct you. We just been times when we think we just don't make sense, you know. Uh, we've had some things happen, you know, we just made a move. Uh, here in the Camarillo, California, I won't go into some of the details, but we had some things kind of backfire on us, and and, and we're very hurtful. Uh, but um, not even though they happen, and yeah, we're asking God, okay, now this has happened. This is what we got to work with. What do you want us to do? How do we handle this? How do we? What do we do? And God's given us direction uh, for to stay where we are uh, for the time being to finish out our, at least our lease that we're in. And uh, he's given us jobs and different things. He's given us some direction. And so we're just following him. You know, uh, uh, if I fail, follow, try, if I fail endeavoring to trust God, I would rather fail endeavoring to trust God than to fail doing it in my own wisdom, my own strength. Or let me just say it this way. I would rather fail endeavoring to trust God than to succeed in doing it my own way. And when I say succeed, just because I, it looks like I succeeded doesn't mean it doesn't have a bunch of holes in it. You know, it just, uh, I would, but I would rather fail endeavoring to trust God. Not, I'm not doing it my own way, not trusting me, but trusting God, than to do it my own way and look like I'm succeeding. I would rather want that. Now, when I say I would rather fail trusting God, I, got, I need to know that I know that I know I'm trusting God in this. I've seen so many people, including myself at times, endeavoring to do something that's ministry-oriented, but I did it my own way. And I, I hid behind the phrase, I'm trusting God, when really, in all reality, I was just trusting me. I was doing it my way. I, I was reasoning. I was coming to my own conclusion. I was being wise in my own eyes, instead of trusting the Lord with all your heart, leaning not in your own understanding, in all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path straight. You know, that's that, 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 what I just quoted from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and 7 is so key uh, to we need to trust God and acknowledge Him in all of our ways. Even when everything's going good, when, even when everything's going well, we need to inquire of the Lord and trust Him. And uh, we need to inquire of God. We need, have, need to have a relationship with God where, in a sense, just like the, the Israelites in the Old Testament, we don't move until the pillar cloud moves. We stayed put. There's been times where, even before our current situation, we were in Ontario, and uh, uh, we felt change was coming, but we stayed put <coughs> until we felt him to direct us elsewhere. And uh, we're kind of in a sabbatical season right now where we're praying what's the next step, and we're praying, we're praying in that direction, you know. And I believe God's going to answer. I believe God's going to show us. Whether that means staying where we are, going back to where we were, or going to a totally new adventure. I don't know what that is, but we're in a season where we're inquiring of God. We want to know that we know that we know that we know we hear from God. And it uh, doesn't mean what we hear from God is always going to be everything pleasant in the natural. It might be something that's totally out of our comfort zone. That could be God too. Uh, just because, uh, you know, God's not going to lead us to tragedy. God's not going to lead us to, but He can lead us to do something that can be out of our comfort zone. Uh, he can do that. So, um, you know, the circumstances cannot be our dictator whether we heard from God or didn't hear from God. They cannot be that. They cannot be on the dashboard where we, where we are controlled by our circumstances. No, we need to be controlled by the Word of God. We need to be led by the Word of God. And that, that needs to lead us and guide us. Because sometimes we may go through some things. There's times throughout God's scripture where God led people to do things that, that were not necessarily safe. <laughs> but they weren't. At the same point in time, we don't need to do a piece of stupid either. You know, where we, we just do it in our own strength and our own wisdom and our own folly. We need to hear God. But just because we hear God doesn't mean it's not going to be, in a sense, in the natural dangerous. But if we're... The safe we have already talked about this in the study. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. 
the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And so we need to follow God. We need to obey God. We need to inquire from God and do what He calls us to do. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but uh, um, anyway, um, anything you want to add to that? So just, just seeing how we're doing on time. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I think I'm going to wrap it up here because uh, this next section is pretty long and I don't want to get too involved in it. So I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, we're talking about the fear of man in context of don't limit God. So hopefully this has been beneficial to you. I'm going to press out and let's see how many things we want to add to that. So hopefully this has been a blessing. Uh, anyway, Lord, we just worship you. We magnify you. And Lord, I pray that you teach all of us, including ourselves, a fresh and how to have a relationship with you. That we will be led by your word. That we be led by you. You are our shepherd. You are our, our guide. And so Lord, that you would lead us by your voice. You would lead us by your presence. You would lead us by your word. And Lord, uh, uh, that we would know, that we know, that we know, that we are doing what you have called us to do. And we will be who you have called us to be. And Lord, we just thank you. We just we worship you, we magnify you, and we give you strength. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name we give you give you praise. Amen. Alright, well God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. And God bless. <laughs>